clock. And Vivek's good. Okay. Uh, welcome to Women in Tech July session. My name is Sarpil Bayraktar, and I'm the uh, program manager or the founder of this program. Uh, today we have a very important topic. Uh, as you know, there. If you don't know, you should know that there is a big uh, transition going on with the cloud being so pervasive. The applications are now running seamlessly uh, in the cloud. And there's a lot of innovation happening, big architectural changes. And that's been going on in the application area for quite a while. Now, with the networking, as you know, we have been talking about uh, NFV, which is the virtualization of the uh, network services. Um, and uh, we talked about in the past service chaining, which is how you put those uh, uh, virtual services together. Um, now it, it seems like a very good time for us to look at the cloud native uh, application uh, orchestration uh, from a networking point of view. And that's where our guest speaker will talk about. And he's going to cover some of the cloud basics as well. Um, he'll talk for about 45, 50 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a QA. Um, our guest speaker is Kyle Mystery. Uh, Kyle actually was with Cisco for quite a while in the cloud business. I don't even know if it was called cloud business back then. Yeah, and working on OpenStack and ODL uh, back then. And then he left and he was at HP. You probably read his bio. And then he was at IBM. Now he's back in uh, Chief Technology and Architecture Office and looking into cloud native from a networking point of view. So he has a lot of experience in open source and cloud. So without further ado, thank you, Kyle. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So thank you for the warm welcome, Serpil. That was excellent. So yeah, so as Serpil said, uh, I'm pretty excited to be here to talk about cloud native uh, and how it relates to NFV and specifically how you know we're going to go about some of this in open source as well. So if the clicker works, which it did, look at that. So I'll, I'm going to quickly cover, um, you know, I just want to make sure everyone's kind of level set with NFV and cloud native. So I'm going to cover that uh, a little bit. Um, then I'm going to talk about why it's important, why we're doing it in the open. And then I'm going to talk about the network service mesh, which is a new project um, that we're working on, um, which is going to help to drive a lot of this cloud native NFE. So, so I always like to, to kind of start, start things with, with a bit of a comic for people, get people laughing a little bit maybe. No one laughed, I should note, so far. But. <laughs> But, um, but anyway, this is the, the classic Dilbert comic about virtualization. Um, but you know what? We're a networking company, right? So we're not doing servers. We're virtualizing the network. Um, and I guess we'll do routers there, too, as well. But, but roughly, you know, that's kind of the joke around what virtualization was from years ago. So, so really, what is NFV? So, so NFV is, is a concept that's been around for at least six years at this point. And it's really, um, it's really about virtualizing network services that used to run on dedicated boxes. Um, it gives you uh, a lot of different uh, benefits. So really, you could think of it like this. Previously, we had physical devices for these types of network services. Um, now, we have virtual versions of them. And by doing this, what do we gain, right? We gain a lot of different uh, advantages, of whether it's cost reductions, um, we can realize all kinds of efficiencies around power, space, and cooling. Uh, deployment times. Deployment times are huge when you virtualize something versus having a physical appliance. You don't have to physically rack something to deploy it. Now it's a virtual machine, so you can boot it much faster. You gain some, some advantages uh, of, around that as well. Um, you know, marketplace of virtual network functions, VNFs. Um, different companies produce these to solve different problems. Um, it creates a marketplace for all of these different companies as well. So, so a quick cloud native background uh, as well, just to level, level set a bit here. So what are the keys to being, to being considered cloud native? So you know, if you look this up on the internet, the general consensus if you want to be cloud native is you have to be containerized, um, you're dynamically orchestrated, um, and you're also built around a microservices architecture as well. Um, and then that quote on the bottom is, is actually from uh, the Pivotal website as well. Uh, around what that is. 
So these are kind of the keys to cloud native. But, but uh, you know, how is that being driven in the industry at this point? Well, the Linux Foundation, which is um, an organization that was originally focused on Linux but has expanded into other open source, they created this Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And this has really kind of become the home for all of the open source projects being built around Cloud Native. And to give you an example of that, um, I'll show you this. And this might be, might be kind of hard to see. Um, this will be in the slides, and, and you can actually go to the CNCF website as well. But this is what they've created for what they call a trail map of Cloud Native. And I won't dive into a lot of this, but what I will, I wanted to point out a few things. So, you know, if you're going to be cloud native, what container runtime do you want to use? Everybody's heard of Docker and the Docker uh, slash Mobi runtime as well. Well, you know, there's some runtimes in the CNCF up here as well. Um, uh, what pluggable networking do you want? That's what CNI is providing here as well, the container networking interface that the CNCF manages. Um, you know, what service mesh and sidecar do you want to use? Istio, Envoy, um, and this concept is important for NSM, which I'll talk about later as well. Um, and then what type of orchestrator? You know, typically Kubernetes is what the CNCF oversees as well. But, but there is something worth noting with all of these tools as well. This is, really, um, this is really just the tooling. This is not your application. All of these things are, are meant to make your application deployable so you can operate it, so you can monitor it. Um, so you can upgrade it, you can do all of these sorts of things, but none of these are actually your application. So this is all the, the things around that, essentially. Uh, this isn't even, you know, this is a nice eye chart, <laughs> I think, actually. But, but I put this in here, this is, so the CNCF maintains this chart uh, in their GitHub page, and I put this up just to show you the vast number of projects across you know, everything from, I mean, I won't go through all of this, obviously we'd be here for easily 45 minutes, but, but there, there is a lot of projects in various states of, of being, you know, actual projects, incubating, graduated, all these different states as well. The CNCF is a, is a vast ecosystem um, up and down the stack. So that's why I put this here. Um, but really what, what I wanted to talk a little bit about was Kubernetes, because Kubernetes seems to have won the orchestration, um, the orchestration war that was going on years ago. Docker Swarm was out there. Um, even Docker supports Kubernetes now. So Kubernetes is kind of the, the platform of choice uh, for orchestration as well. And these are just a few stats on that in case people aren't aware. Um, it really came from Google and it kind of grew out of their own internal usage uh, of Borg, which they use internally. It was started by Google engineers. Um, the first production grade release was in July 2015, three years ago. Um, really, really, Kubernetes is about being kind of like Linux for distributed systems. Um, and that's, if you think about it that way, it's kind, of, it's kind of easy to understand what it is as well. And it's really all about um, declarative things, right? So the admin declares the state, the desired state of the system, and Kubernetes does its best to try to make sure that the system runs at that desired state level. Um, and when you're talking distributed systems, it's doing it across many different nodes and things like that as well. So what, why is all of this cloud native, why is it important uh, to networking? What's going on that makes this so important and why, why are we talking about this now? Um, really, if you look at where networking is going and, and NF, uh, NFV, where it's going, um, all of these things, you know, NFV, 5G, edge computing, IoT, they're all driving increases um, in different networking requirements going forward. Over the next few years, you're going to see increases in connected devices because of this. You're going to see increased bandwidth, increased cloud service load. All of these things are going to drive all of these increases as well. And so all of these operators of these networks, all of the mobile operators, uh, the service providers, all of them, they're facing all of these challenges as all of this, this comes to be. So, you know, if we want to move the old NFV to cloud native, you know, what do we have to do? Um, you could think of there's two things really that we, that we want to do to get it there, right? So the first thing is you have all of these NFV VNFs. Those are the virtual machines that I mentioned before. They all need to be changed and they need to be rewritten as, as cloud native essentially. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit 
in, in some slides here in a second as well. And then the thec second thing is, you know, we, we kind of need an API to be able to do this as well. Um, almost like type um, like a Kubernetes API, but something for NFV and for cloud native. So, so really, um, let's take a look at NFV and see what the problem is. R really, it's really the problem is in the V. Um, <laughs> NFV is really based on virtualization. Um, cloud native is based on containers. So really, we've got to move these VNFs, we've got to move it really to CNFs, container network functions. And this, this is definitely possible, but we have to be able to do that to, to get things to, to cloud native, to get NFV to cloud native. Um, really, we want to be able to take advantage of these, these technologies with, with NFV. Um, these are the things that are going to let us drive it towards um, you know, container network functions and really drive it towards container network virtualization. Uh, as well. Um, so there's another problem here, and I'll illustrate this in a bit, but this kind of shows it, right? There's this packaging overhead problem. Um, VNFs are great and the industry moved towards them, but the problem is you have to pack a lot of extra things inside of uh, a VNF to actually make it, uh, make the network function. If you're doing a virtual machine, you're packing a whole specification for that virtual machine, you're packing an operating system, all of the standard libraries, uh, it becomes quite large. If you've ever tried to download some of these VNFs, they're, they're huge and they're not, they're not something you're gonna pull down easily. Um, so, so how do we get there, right? So this, this is what I was just uh, talking about. Th this is typically what a VNF might look like with the virtual machine image, the operating system, the hardware, the application stack. Um, if you can move to a container network function, really you can get rid of those middle layers effectively. You end up with a container image and then your application running inside of it as well and you're able to more effectively make that container network function be really about the application and the network function that it's gonna provide. Um, so superior agility. So this is another advantage, I think, of what, of what cloud native can bring to, to NFV as well. So it's, there's a nice little stick person here <laughs> with a nice uh, mobile phone. I don't know, it's, it could be an iPhone, I don't know. But anyways, so this person is utilizing a brand new app that looks really awesome. Say, hey, this, this new app is spectacular. I love this app, but what is this app really doing? It's doing stuff in the cloud. So, so, with, you know, so maybe this app is, is talking to a load balancer at first. That could be a container image. Maybe then it's going to a firewall. Maybe there's some, some DPI being done on it. And then finally, maybe we'll get to the application. And these could all be container images running in the cloud somewhere. Either doesn't matter if it's public or private. Um, and this works out great. So now the same person that was running that app says, hey, everyone else, all my friends, this app is great. So now this app kind of goes viral. Everyone else starts to look at it as well. So now you have more stick people with the app. <laughs> so the nice thing about container network functions is maybe everyone gets their own copy of all of the network functions as CNFs rather than aggregating things over VNF images. So now everyone can have a container because they're really tiny. You're talking tens of megabytes instead of gigabytes. You can spin them up dynamically. They're just running the network functions for that app. So it's a pretty huge advantage, um, I think, for this. And this is, really, this is really where we want to go. And this is ultimately why we want to go there. This is one of the use cases. So uh, ease of deployment. Um, this again goes into kind of what I was talking about before as well. If we look at this stack again, there's a lot of things here. And there's some questions that you might have if you look at this, right? You know, how does this work with my hypervisor? You know, because guess what? These virtual machine images, they might not be compatible across all the hypervisors. Or they might be compatible, but they might not be compatible across the different versions as well. Um, why does this take so long to boot? Has anyone booted one of these? Sometimes they take a long time to boot. Um, this looks like a pretty large attack surface too, doesn't it? And all of this in here, none of this is really related to your application. But you can bet that people writing malware are targeting that as well. Um, and then what happens if you want to upgrade? Do you have to upgrade the operating system in these? How would you know? Does your vendor know? Someone needs to know because that has to be upgraded as well. So, you know, if you look back at this, the diagram that I had posted before, uh, with the container image, you know, so this, this, this helps to solve some of these problems, I think, right? Because you end up with a standard image and a runtime format. If you think back 
to the CNCF slide. There are standard container runtime formats, so you can make the, you can make this run on a much wider variety of platforms that way. Um, there's a, it's much faster to boot. We don't have to boot an operating system. We don't have to run through a simulated BIOS to boot it, to, to set up hardware registers that aren't even there. There's all kinds of things we can optimize around just booting this container image versus the, the virtual one. Um, we don't have to upgrade the operating system layer. All of that middle layer in there that I talked about, that can all go away with these container uh, network functions as well. And, um, you know, we can actually, we can upgrade these much simpler, especially uh, by just, you know, loading new versions of them with a different version of the API as well. And then new users can point to the new API version. You can get rid of the old ones. So really there's a lot of benefits to, uh, to this approach. And really we, gotta, we have to do this as an industry to move uh, NFV towards this. Yeah, okay. So, so now I've talked a lot about you know, why uh, cloud native is important, but, but why is it important to do it in the open as well? Um, and and uh, as Serpil said, you know, I've done a lot of open source work here at Cisco and HP and IBM as well. And, and I can tell you that you know, it's, all about, it's all about the platform. It really is all about the platform here. A lot of the service providers, um, they all want an open platform. They, they really do. And, and you know, the winning one, like it says up here, you know, is going to be something that anyone can build for, anyone can use, anyone can deploy to. Um, and really that core platform allows a lot of the operators and providers at least some level of assurance that, that there's, it's a level playing field, which is really what they want. And it really allows us to move the innovation into the CNFs, to be honest, as well. The platform can be, can be totally open source. The CNFs can be as well, but you can innovate in that area. Um, you can innovate there as well. So I, I thought it would be interesting to, to take a look maybe at the last approximately nine years or so of open source networking. Um, there's, there's been a lot of projects that have come out, and so I'll kind of walk through a little bit of these. You know, Open vSwitch is, I'm sure if you've heard of open source networking, that project has been around for, for a long time. Um, OpenStack, OpenStack Neutron did a lot of networking, um, had a lot of projects built around it as well. Um, that's Ryu. Has anyone heard of Ryu? Anyone in the room? So Ryu was a Python, Python-based uh, OVS controller that was an early SDN controller as well. Uh, DPDK from Intel that allowed us to move packet processing uh, out, out of the kernel and into user space. Um, Open Daylight, I know Cisco did a lot of work in Open Daylight amongst many other companies as well. Um, Onos, which was another open source SDN controller. Um, Faucet, has anyone heard of Faucet? That's another unique one. That's, that is like a, a Google project as well, another, yet another open source SDN controller. Um, we have Open Switch, which was an open source network operating system for, for merchant silicon based switches. Um, let's see, OpNFV, which was an attempt at open source NFV management. We have uh, FDIO, which is the home of VPP, uh, user space uh, packet processing. And then we have Envoy, which is a sidecar data plane proxy for service, mes uh, service meshes. Uh, Panda, which is um, analytics. We have uh, ONAP, uh, we have uh, Istio, we're almost done, I promise. We have Danos, <laughs> and then we have, I had to put NSM. And, but the reason I wanted to highlight this was there's, there's been, and I didn't put everything up here. I tried to pick a, a variety across, the, the, across uh, these different layers, but there's a lot of open source networking innovation that's really happened over the last nine years, and it's almost accelerating. I mean, you can see more projects the closer to the, to the current year that you get. Um, and, the, and a lot of these, a lot of these end up being, being platforms as well. You know, Open vSwitch is used by a lot of things. Open Daylight was a platform, OpenStack. So the platform play is, is important with, with a lot of these uh, as well. But, but the industry definitely has embraced this. The Linux Foundation has embraced it. Service providers have embraced it. They're all members of the Linux Foundation. Um, AT&T actually were the, the people that, that open sourced uh, Danos. Um, so they're all kind of getting involved in this uh, as well. So, 
so yeah, so, so this, so you know, the platform has to be open source, like I said, uh, the, definitely the providers want it. Um, one thing that's worth noting is, you know, what's really appealing about, about the open source for the operators is the fact that um, you end up with frequent releases. Um, a lot of these open source projects like Ubuntu, Fedora, OpenStack, Kubernetes, they release early, they release often, so you get a lot of releases. Um, and also their continuous integration and continuous deployment is, is done in the open as well. So you can see the testing results for all the patches. You can see the testing results for the releases. All of that is in the open as well. I think that's, that's pretty important <clears throat> as well. Um, so let's see this. Oh yeah, this is, oh, so open platforms are definitely built on open source, but, but it takes, it takes many different roles to make these open source projects successful. So one of the first role is a maintainer. Maintainer is not just provides code, but really maintains the code on GitHub or Garrett or wherever it is. Maintainers check in code. Um, they will approve patches. They will review patches. They'll help to onboard new, new people submitting code. Maintainers are super important to a healthy open source ecosystem. Um, vendors are important as well. Um, Vendors provide solutions wrapped around open source as well. A classic example that everyone is aware of is Red Hat. Red Hat provides a, a lot of solutions and it's all built on open source. Everything they do is built on open source. Um, another role is, is an expert. An expert uh, provides support on the open source projects. If you've ever looked at an open source project or worked with one, you'll definitely run into experts in the community. They're usually the people that will uh, volunteer their time to help you or will be on the mailing list answering questions. Um, they'll write sometimes documentation or wiki pages. Um, so they will do that. Uh, the community itself also provides advice. Um, it's, it's part of the, a, a healthy open source community. And then you have, we can't forget about the users. The users actually provide feedback on these open source projects. And so, so really all of this is what kind of creates a healthy open source community. And it's, it's worth noting that you can be multiple roles as well. You can be, uh, vendors obviously have maintainers, they have users and vice versa. But really, for your open source project to be successful, these are, these are kind of the five roles that you really need. So now uh, I would like to talk a little bit about Network Service Mesh, which is a project that we just started uh, in April, late April, early May. Um, so, so fundamentally, uh, before we talk about network service mesh, I, I just want to level set on what a network service is, right? So, so let's say we have two network services, A and B. Um, we're just going to send packets back and forth between them as well. Whoops, I had to go back. There we go. That's really it. That's all a network service is. <laughs> I thought there was more. It's that simple. Just. It's doing something with the packets. What's it doing? We don't know. It could be doing firewall. It could be doing load balancing. But something's happening. Packets are coming in. They're going out. Um, so realistically, when, when we looked at this again, um, you know, what are we doing with NFV, right? So, so NFV VNFs, they, they definitely want to be able to send and receive these payloads. Typically, they want to do this at layer two or layer three. Um, that's where they want to do it. They want to use things like Ethernet, IP, MPLS, VXLAN, these types of encapsulations. What you'll notice is, um, if you're familiar with like Istio, none of these things are, are part of Istio. They're not even part of Kubernetes. If anyone's looked at the CNI, uh, for example, you're not going to see any of these words in, in there as well um, because it's focused higher up the stack, whereas NFV and container network functions, they're all, they want to focus down the stack more at a lower layer. So. So, so let's, let's take a look at what the abstractions would be for, for a network service mesh, what we have. So right here, we just have a, a simple pod of containers in Kubernetes term, and a pod is multiple containers that operate as, as uh, providing one service. We have an interface to it as well. So now, there's only three core concepts in network service mesh in the project, and one of them actually is a network service as well. And, and like I've been saying, it, it logically does something to packets. This network service will do something. Um, all networks provide network services, but not all network services are, are well described as networks. That's, that's, think on that for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So the other core concept, the second core concept that we have is a network service endpoint. So a network service endpoint is a concrete instance. It's actually the thing that you can connect to a network service. Um, it may be a pod, it might be something external. Um, you could see a network service could be its own pod, of, but it also could be an actual physical router. It could be a legacy VNF. It's just something that does packets and the endpoint is what connects that. And the last concept we have for network service mesh is, is this connection. We used to call them channels. Sometimes if you look at the source repo, some of it still says channels. <clears throat> But really, really, this, this channel is the tube into which you send and receive packets. That's all that it is. Um, these pods, they might see these channels as kernel interfaces. They could see them as VETH interfaces, memory interfaces. They could be, they could be anything like that, really. Um, it may involve tunnels. It, it doesn't have to involve tunnels. It might. Um, but really, these are the three core concepts that make up the Network Service Mesh project. Network services, um, connections and network service endpoints. And with this, we can actually build some, some pretty interesting um, applications for CNFs and abstract a lot of the networking complexity of what tunnels these are, the addressing in them, all of this sort of stuff, abstract all that away from, from the users who just want to get their pods connected to these network services. Um, this is another way to look at this. <clears throat> this, if you've looked at the Envoy project, You've seen a diagram that's similar to this. I think that, that that's where we got this, this diagram from. But really, this is showing the green, the green diagram or the green boxes are network services. And really, uh, the blue are the sidecar proxies that are going to provide the data path for a lot of this as well. Um, now we really go down and we can look at this, imagining what it is. So if you've looked at Kubernetes, um, the applications that you run, everything is done through, through a YAML file, which is what that looks like over there. So this is really, this is really an actual example of kind of what um, our sample YAML files will look like. Um, you can define a network service. It has an API version, has a bunch of metadata associated with it. It has some selectors, which indicate uh, the channels right there as well. Um, so you can indicate what channels you are and what payloads those channels um, are providing as well. So that, that's, that's what that is. And like I said, this, all of this actually exists in the GitHub repository at this point, which I'll have a pointer to at the end. But, but how do we, I guess what I'd like to show now is how does this all get connected and how does this work? So if we look at, at this where we have two pods of containers perhaps uh, on the same node, and a node is a host, so how would this all, how would this all get connected together and actually work, right? Um, so you'd have an NSM, and the NSM um, is itself is actually a daemon set, and a daemon set is something you define in Kubernetes. You specify which nodes it, it's going to run on by, by what label you have the node set as. Typically, you'd run the NSM on every node, or at least every node that you want to provide network services. Um, so that's what you do there. So the network service endpoint would then expose its own channel, like I had talked about before. So it'll say, I have this channel. I'm going to expose this. So the NSM itself uh, gets that registration. Um, the pod will then request a connection. So in the pod's YAML file, for the application that someone's running, they'll say, uh, I actually need um, a channel of this, of this type. So then it'll go to the NSM to request that. Uh, the NSM will request that to the network service endpoint uh, connection as well. And that connection will then uh, either be accepted or not, depending upon if that network service endpoint can, can provide that. At that point, an interface will be created. So the NSM itself will create an interface because this isn't hooked up to anything yet, and this isn't either. It just has the Kubernetes interface. It doesn't have the data interface yet. So this will end up getting created at that point. Um, we'll inject that into the network service endpoint, whether it's a kernel interface, a memory interface, or whatever it is. So now the network service endpoint is connected as well. We'll go on the other side. Remember, this is all on one node, so this NSM has visibility to all of this. It can actually create the interface for the pod as well. It can inject that into the pod um, at that point. And then it will cross-connect the interfaces locally um, and do whatever it needs to make it so that that pod and that network service endpoint can communicate. Um, then it'll accept that, that, that connection as well. 
Um, we actually have the majority of this code for the simple case pretty much working at this point, having just started working on this. But I know there's a lot there, but that's in, in a lot of detail how that would work. Um, and that's for the same node, right? And it should be noted that all of those connections are all just done over gRPC locally, um, just over local file descriptors. Carl, can you give an example? Yes. Can you go back to that picture? Yes. Um, so node would be like a server. Node is a server. And then network service mesh manager is new. Correct. What would be the network source endpoint like? Like, is it a virtual router, virtual? That's a good question. So, so this the simplest example is that this network service endpoint could just be something that's going to create like um, simple VETH interfaces and then just cross connect them like is done here. It could be something that that programs a, a different virtual switch, whether it's in the kernel or it's a user space switch, or it could be something this network service endpoint that actually programs something external to the node physical router, um, or, or maybe it's a VNF running on a hypervisor that's not a part of the Kubernetes cluster. So that's also new? Yes, yes. Yeah, these are, these are new. The, you know, the pod is obviously a pod, an application that someone's running. Network service manager, network service endpoint, those are new, yeah. So then NSE is really not the NSE functional, like a virtual firewall or anything. It is just an interface acting to the right. virtual firewall. So in the data path here, uh, how will, so basically the data path used to be to redirect the data traffic to your virtual firewall, virtual router. Exactly. That so that, right, exactly, that could, it, right, so the question was, um, the network service endpoint is setting up the data path, but where is, where is it, you know, what's happening, where's the traffic going? In the simplest example, let's say that this is a programmable virtual switch, so the network service endpoint could just be programming that function down into the virtual switch. Um, for more complex things, you're right, it might just have to redirect the virtual switch to send the traffic out a different port yeah. to something that can then handle the traffic and send it back. Right. You're right, yep. So then there will be some more interfaces to the actual virtual firewall or actual yes. service functions. It, correct, there, will, there, could be more, there could be more interfaces. And this is, the, this is the simplest example where you're just kind of connecting things, but you're right, it definitely can get more complex. Um, and it gets even more complex if things are outside of the pod and you're programming physical routers um, or you're programming VN like legacy VNFs on a hypervisor or something like that as well. So, um, so I, will, I wanted to walk through. So now this case is very similar to the last case. The main difference now is we have the, NS, uh, the network service endpoint is on a different node. So now we're crossing nodes. Um, the setup for this looks very similar to the setup for the last one. Um, this network service endpoint will expose its channel, um, except at this point, we're gonna store this in the Kubernetes A API server, so we're creating that up there. We use custom resource definitions, which is a way for uh, to, that allows us to extend the Kubernetes API such that we can make use of their API server, their database, and everything, and all of the, the commands like um, kubectl and all of those things work normally. Um, so now the pod again will request a connection to its local NSM that's running on its own node. Um, that will go ahead and it will go up and it will select the network service endpoint it wants. Turns out it's on a different node, so it will send a request connection over to that network service manager. That will actually request at the endpoint. The endpoint will say, hey, I can handle this, so it will, it will actually accept that. It will go ahead, similar to before, it will create, create the, uh, the interface. It'll actually plumb that interface into the network service endpoint pod. Then it will actually, in this case, we have to go across nodes. So this example is showing, well, hey, we're gonna create some sort of tunnel using whatever, um, whatever um, type, whether that's VXLAN or MPLS or whatever, we'll create this tunnel across. So now NSM2 will accept that over to NSM1, um, which means, hey, the NSM1 says, okay, this is good. So I can create an interface now. I can hook that into the pod. Um, and then at this point, I can actually complete that end of the tunnel and accept the connection again. So this, this example is a little more complex. Like you had the question about that. So in this example, we actually had to build a tunnel to, to get the packets across over there as well. Um, and the interesting thing is, when this was exposing its channel, it maybe just said, uh, I will advertise a channel with a payload type of VXLAN 
or something. So if the pod had requested, if the YAML file for that pod was a different tunnel type, then obviously this, NS, this NSE couldn't handle that. But, but you could have multiple NSEs with those different tunnel types as well, depending upon where you want to send the traffic and things like that. So if you and service provider use cases, uh, if wherever they have, say, segment routing or MPLS more prevalent, you can establish those tunnels right. specific to those environments. That's right. Yeah, the question was in service provider environments, uh, maybe where they have MPLS uh, is pretty prevalent, they can do that as well, right? They could create those tunnels and they could send that traffic into their existing infrastructure if they wanted, as an example. So, um, yeah, so let's see. So now, oh, and then I had one more animation. So uh, it's worth noting that, like I said, this, this network service mesh project is, it, it's really brand new. There's, we just started this late April, early May. Really, it wasn't until kind of late May, early June when we really started pushing code for this. And we've already, we've got some folks from Red Hat, Cisco, Palo Alto, VArmor, um, Travelping, and Packet as well um, that are helping us work on this as well. In fact, um, we just we just started talking with Packet.net because they, they Packet.net provides a bare metal cloud. They work with the CNCF and specifically the testing group and the CI group there, continuous integration group, around providing uh, resources to be able to do continuous integration testing. Um, because if you have not tried to run Minikube in Travis, then you definitely shouldn't, I'm going to say. That's, that's not fun, but it works, but it's, it's tough. So this will give us more resources to test this as well, um, for sure. And so, so I kind of wanted to, to end this with almost a, a call to action. If people are interested, right? I have to end it with a call for action, right? We've got we've to be inspired a bit, right? So this, we definitely could use Network Service Mess really need you as well. It would be great uh, if anyone has an interest, if anyone wants to, to learn more about this. Um, you know, this is just a kind of a screencast of our GitHub page as well at this point. Um, but we, you know, but, but we have a lot of documentation out there. Uh, I think some of this actually changed even since I took this picture, so it's been changing. But we have, you know, we have weekly meetings on Friday early in the morning. Uh, there's an IRC channel for those. How many people are familiar with IRC? Some people, yes. I like that. That's good. Yeah. We may have to get a Slack channel. How many people are familiar with Slack? Yeah, a lot more people. That's, I think we'll have to get a Slack channel at some point. Uh, we have a mail list as well. We have a use case document, and that's actually been huge. That use case document, um, I, I didn't cover a lot of the other use cases. I just kind of picked the simple two, but there's a lot of use cases that are actually written in that use case document that are much more complex and go into a lot more detail as well. But that's what we're trying to drive uh, the code around is the use case document. Um, that's been super important, I think, for that. Uh, and then I also I put a link to, to a Kubernetes tutorial on here as well. Um, how many people have used Kubernetes? Is, have there, is there some people in the audience? Yeah? That's good. That's excellent. For those that haven't, uh, there's, you know, there's a bunch of tutorials out there that will get you up to speed really quick if you're interested in that as well. Um, and what Kubernetes is. Yeah. What it is. Oh, well, yeah. And Kubernetes, again, is the orchestration platform as well that will orchestrate all of the, the containers. So, so yeah. That, that's right. There we go. That's right. That used to be called something else, right? Yeah, Spark. That's right. Spark. I knew that. Yeah. I know. There's there definitely is a lot of communication channels. So really, I, I know I, I hit the end of the slides a little bit early, but and I'd love to answer questions if you have questions. Um, anything? Thank you. I can open it up for everyone. Oh, <laughs> get a tough question to start. So I'm thinking yeah. uh, the applicability of network service mesh as you go through this. For example, we have the OPNFV, yeah. open source project. Yes. How would they, for example, utilize this? Could they utilize it? Um, Definitely. I think it would. So I've, I've been involved a little bit with OPNFV, and it's more my understanding from OPNFV is they, they almost like an open source system integrator. They take a lot of other components and they build, they build NFE, like an open source repl reference implementation 
almost. So definitely, if they move in the direction of building CNFs, container network functions, network service mesh is kind of a logical way for them uh, to put them together, mesh them all together, and be able to, to build complex topologies that way. And you mean, when you say CNF, that's the equivalent of old NFV? We're moving from that, NFV to CNF? Yeah, we're moving from VNFs to CNFs. Oh, Virtual VNFs network to functions to container network functions. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Any questions, Mom? Webex? Excellent. So, what Cisco products are already using this platform? Oh, th there's nothing using it yet because it, it, it really is just brand new in the last few months. Um, so, it's, it's not even fully ready. Our, our goal is to get it, uh, we're, we're trying to get it ready for KubeCon in December so that we can. We can show it off and uh, at that point and, and really talk about it there. I think we're going to try to talk about it at um, the Open Networking Summit in Europe as well. Um, so that, that's the goal. But we are working actually with uh, the cloud business unit and, and the folks working on uh, the Cisco Container Platform, CCP, as well to get it integrated there. That, that would be a logical place for it. So for the uh, CCNFV, what would be the uh, network functions normally would be good um, examples of using this, like a bringing like together firewalls or? Right, exactly. All of that list, you could do firewalls, load balancers. You could do routers as well, built using this as well. And, and the thing about the way that we've tried to design NSM is we realize Definitely that the future is all around containers and cloud native, right? But there isn't a whole existing kind of ecosystem built around virtual machines and VNFs. And let's not forget physical appliances as well. And that's why I was trying to stress that, you know, we all want to get to CNFs. We all want to get to container network, container networking. But NSM is kind of built so we can make use of the existing virtual and physical um, appliances and network services as well while we get there. And I think that's pretty important. There's a large installed base of all of that as well. And shifting the industry, I mean, look how long it took to shift to virtual. Shifting it to containers is going to take even longer, I think. That was my next question. Uh, how much of the VNFs are deployed? How much uh, yeah. deployment tracking did it have? And is yeah. that part of the reason why network service mesh was kind of worn? I don't know about the deployment. That I don't know. But, but really, I think. I think one of the reasons that we wanted to create NSM was, was around all of the scale requirements that I had talked about with things like 5G and IoT, um, increased cloud usage. I mean, all of those, everything, bandwidth, endpoint count, everything is going up even more. Um, and that's why I think it makes sense to move these um, network services into containers so because you of couldn't, the advantages. Yeah. So you couldn't do that with NFV and service function chaining? Well. If you look closely, NSM uh, might this might look like service function chaining. I was waiting for that question, so <laughs> definitely. Any other questions? Anything about the cloud native? Oh yeah. I do have a question. Uh, before yes. yeah, I'm from marketing, so before you lost me completely, <laughs> <laughs> there was a slide about. Um, uh, about the different apps that are you you know that are being used and right now, um, what, the way you showed it is that they're going to be like pieces of these apps, and uh, when you scale them up, then you'll have uh, the same units yeah. in the cloud, right? Yeah. How do you orchestrate all of these? I mean, that's a lot of man management that's, to do, right? That's a great question, and that actually uh, is what Kubernetes is is providing for us in that deployment, Kubernetes is orchestrating that. So you kind of, uh, that's where I talked about the kind of the declarative state. You kind of declare as the operator um, in your YAML files for your apps what you want it to look like and then Kubernetes does its best to make it match that as well. Got it, okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank and so you. that's why Kubernetes is kind of important and why, there are a lot, like Docker Swarm was another orchestrator. Um, Hashi has this Nomad application that kind of does orchestration as well, um, but Kubernetes is really kind of where a lot of the industry mindshare is kind of moved at this point. So, yeah, definitely. thank you. Yeah. Oh, a WebEx question. 
So the question is, do you think this increase of CNFs will increase more pub, uh, public or private cloud workloads or both? And rewording it, do you think this increase of CNFs will increase, I don't know, same, same question. <laughs> so will it increase public or private or both? Yeah. I, I really think it, it, it could be both. I mean, I mean honestly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase both public and private, wherever you run it. Um, and really, that's the thing um, about the container platforms. You can run them public, you can run them in private. All the big clouds, uh, they all provide Kubernetes uh, platforms at this point. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, they all provide Kubernetes runtimes um, and that sort of abstraction. And then obviously on the private cloud side, I mean, you know, there's, that's pretty prevalent as well. So I think it will increase no matter where you want to run it, you can do it that way. Yeah. So if nobody else, I have another question. Oh, definitely. So who's on point for security? Uh, in the, in just in general, in NSM or, or, or in in the new configuration, who's going to yeah. be the, and also following up on the private versus public cloud, who's going to be, you know, the endpoint yeah. or? Where is that? Well, I think a lot of, to some extent, what NSM can do, it, it, it almost allows the operators to provide security for those pods of applications because you can essentially build these meshes that include network services that might provide security functions in those as well. So I think if, if that's really one way to, to look at it is, is it's almost helping to provide that security for the operators as well. There's, there's a whole, I, I, I did not go through, there's another slide deck we have that's kind of a, almost a narrative introduction to what this is and it walks through that, almost that example where the, the user, and it's like uh, the user in the story wants to run this pod of applications but connect back to her, to her corporate uh, network but the, the struggles she has to go through to get that pod to connect back with VPN concentrators and firewalls and all this, it becomes a challenge. And, and what we're hoping is NSM can abstract a lot of that away um, so that you can just put some things in your YAML file, it'll route the traffic to where it needs to go, and the operator or the corporate side can provide all that, that infrastructure underneath. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we can include that slide in the yeah. Back in the, and I send out the survey, yeah, I can include that. Definitely. So if we want to help uh, contribute to the um, open source, what would that engagement look like? Um, I mean, essentially, what would we do? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. No, it's great. So I, I, I did not have a slide on this, but I mean, the first thing you think of when you think of open source is code contributions. And that's obviously a huge part of it, um, but it's not the only part of it. And if you think back to the five, shaped figure I had up there, the, the Pentagon about, about that. Really, there's, there's a lot of other things. Documentation is huge. Just using it and reporting issues. Um, there's all kinds of different contributions outside of uh, and around the code as well. Um, so definitely coming to the, the meeting, signing up on the mailing list. Um, really, those are where we're, we're at now. And then, like I said, we do have the IRC channel. Though um, I will have to admit to Ed that we may need a Slack channel at some point just as well, but, but yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Maybe you had this question answered in that slide deck as well. So I was just thinking, um, how would say a service provider could use network service mesh? Yeah. Example, it's, can you talk to it or? Yeah, definitely. I think that one example even that I had um, set up where, you know, with the users and the applications um, and I, I could bring that back up, but you know the, the cloud where you know the user's application is a container, but then you have all those other things, DPI, firewalls, load balancers, and everything like that. Um, service providers could definitely use NSM to build that mesh of services. So when the application providers are running in the cloud somewhere, they can just hook up and send it over to that initial NSE, that network service endpoint that the service provider defines, and then from that point, it'll hit the mesh and it'll go through whatever the, the service provider has defined. That's the thinking, at least, hopefully. Excellent. Any other questions? I just wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, since now in 5G and all the data, data throughputs are increasing and we need low latency applications. So all this uh, virtualization or going, the packets actually going up uh, to the kernel or touching the software, right? Is 
making might make it more uh, prone to latencies and all right and so right uh, so what do you think it would be the right balance uh, with this versus having uh, customized hardware which do all the data processing on the data path and you push the policies from the controller down to the uh, to the uh, to the customized hardware and then actually process the packet. Uh, Definitely. So so you're almost. Are you talking something like a smart NIC almost, or even doing it in the infrastructure, in, like in the switch the or MPU, yeah, yeah, inside something the, like that. Well, definitely, and that's definitely possible as well. You could almost envision uh, a network service endpoint if you have that sort of capability in your ASIC, for example, um, either in a switch or a router. You can envision an NSE programming it in that hardware device. Um, and just redirecting the flows from the node to go down there as well. Um, so you could definitely see that as well. You could see something similar if you had smart NICs as well and you wanted to program things on the smart NICs as well. Um, or if you just want to do it um, in a typical kernel-based virtual switch or in a user space-based virtual switch, all of that. Um, I think that's actually like almost an operational trade-off as well. And then you start getting into things about, sure, you have these great big distributed apps and things are moving between them and that. But now you have to talk about where you're going to deploy those, because if they're just scattered all across the data center, then that might not be optimal if your traffic is, you know, moving yeah. through many switches and nodes to get there. So, um, and again, with Kubernetes, you should be able to kind of like push those together to maybe get them to run on a set of nodes um, using labels, for example, and, and selectors. So, okay. Thank excellent. You. Thanks. So. Uh, great, great overview, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about service providers. As you mentioned, they've really jumped on the whole open source bandwagon where they thought they could get rest control from vendors like us uh, over the whole networking. But uh, many engineering years later and millions and millions of dollars, they actually have little to show for it in terms of getting to right. real carrier class services where they get to. So this appears to simplify it a little bit relative to VNFs, and the whole cumbersome OS and VMs and things like that. But it still, still still seems to be very complex for them to go through the full integration process. So we'd welcome your thoughts on that and what Cisco is doing about it to alleviate the, some of yeah. the pain that they're suffering. Yeah, definitely. So I think first of all, I think it's interesting you, you pointed out you know how the surface providers have all jumped into open source and they were thinking that, but, but I think um, they, they, still, they still do need you know, vendors and other people to help them with that as well. You could almost think of it as the relationship between the vendors and the service providers um, and a lot of the operators um, just moved to include open source as part of that conversation and, and as part of that relationship, I think, as well. So now that's, that's why we as vendors have to engage in open source um, just to be able to have the conversation with, I think, a lot of those, those big operators and that. So that even if they may not be using it, it allows us to continue that conversation and, and be a part of that relationship as well, I think. Um, now, how does this help to simplify some of that for them? Uh, for that, you're gonna have to go look at that use case document a little bit and see, because we do have some more complex use cases in there, but we would love to get more feedback on some of that as well. Um, yeah, excellent. Oh, one behind you there, yeah. So what if um, you are already an NFV customer? So from if looking through their lens, is it better for them to stay in NFV and the future applications you put them, provision them in container? Or is it better for them to actually migrate from NFV to containers? To containers. Yeah, that, that's always, a, that's always a, a tough question is, you know, because there's always going to be a future. In the technology industry, there's always something else that's, that's coming out. Um, so, you know, first of all, I, I don't expect this to be in any sort of state for probably at least nine months to 12 months where you could deploy it and actually use it in, in, in production, uh, just based on where we're at now. But, but I would say that, that we are trying to do our best to, to incorporate um, even VNFs and existing NFV applications um, by allowing uh, people to write network service endpoints that could incorporate that existing technology. So the hope would be you could make use of that existing um, deployment or investment that you have there, um, and then as vendors come out with CNFs, or CNFs are, are become more available, maybe there's a marketplace of them, then you could also deploy those as well. 
Do you think there will be some sort of a resistance from the VNF community? I, there, there, there may be. I mean, there, you know, NFV faced some resistance, I think, early on as well. That's just kind of part of it as well, I think. But, but really, you know, as much as we can try to make it inclusive of all of that technology and move it forward, um, because the reality is, I think it's it's going to move that direction regardless. So, that's that's everything's moving cloud native nowadays. So, excellent. Oh yes. I want to pick up on, on, on that. It, it seems to me that uh, economics would win out, wouldn't it? Yeah. So it was, isn't this going to be a far more economical solution once, once we've got to a stable and mature point? I mean, I think that's, that's, the, that's the idea, right? Because that's, that was the whole idea with virtualization was it could make it more economical. You can now, instead of having one big server running one application, you can now put multiple applications on there as well. So containers almost take it even a step further maybe going from tens of extra applications, now you can go to hundreds or thousands because they're just tiny little containers and they come and go. So I think you're right, economics will help drive that. And I would expect you should be able to get far greater performance than what they could out uh, with VNFs and all that extra packaging, right? Right, exactly, right, because now you're not, you don't have that whole layer of the operating system, the virtual hardware and everything like that running as well, it's just containers, so. Now the next question would be, where are you going to run those on bare metal or in a virtual machine, you know, in a hypervisor themselves? But that's that's a discussion for a different uh, talk, I think. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything the mix? Okay, then. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for making the time. Oh. Yeah. So. In, thank you so much. And in August, we're going to have an entrepreneur come up and talk about how she started this really interesting camp for girls. It's a film camp for girls. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly say that in November, Women in Tech will be five years old. And we're going to have a party. And I hope you all come in. <laughs>